All right, I still don't know how I'm going to put all this stuff together, guys, but I'll tell you, ever since I've had the revelation that my thyroid is under a little bit of stress uh, with a high TSH reading showing that my body is producing hormones to tell my thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone, I got a little concerned. But it's turning out, I think in general, to be a revelation to me about something I've been dealing with my whole life. And now because I've been so focused on my health and taking a look at things that I never took a look at, never took a look at before. Things I didn't understand about my blood work. I didn't understand anything. I only understood exactly what they told me, that if the LDL was high, then that was bad. If triglycerides were high, that was bad. And I really didn't know what any of the other numbers meant. I just had to trust the doctors to tell me the truth. And as I dug into these things, I used to find, I eventually found out that a lot of this stuff, it seems like they're making it up as they go. But there are some things that are quite useful. And if your body is telling your thyroid to produce thyroid hormone in high quantities because it's not getting enough, then something ain't right. And even though I was supplementing iodine, thinking that was going to help because I had th I've had thyroid on my radar for a little while. I didn't I didn't know that, for instance, like my doctor said, and I have a very good doctor, somebody who's actually open to listening about carnivore and is looking at these things, and he doesn't think there's anything wrong with my diet. So I'm trying to figure out exactly what am I missing because I've heard other doctors on YouTube, like uh, Doctor Elizabeth, what is her name? Dr. Elizabeth Bright, that is a thyroid specialist, and she's been talking about thyroid and carnivore diet. So for me to be having this thyroid issue and having been on a, car a carnivore diet for three years, it just makes me question. And I'm trying to understand why maybe I'm not getting the healing in that area that I should get. I already think I know the answer, but it's one of those things that's in a personal area that doesn't deal with what I eat, but it does deal with some other stimulants that I've had in my life before and that I've also let creep back in over the past three years and then cut them back out again and then let them creep back again and then cut them back out again and then just recently I cut them back out again and I'm talking about caffeine, nicotine, and THC or a legal form of THC known as Delta-8 in the most recent case. In every case in my life where I have had symptoms like I experienced recently that my doctor said were the symptoms to watch for along with high TSH and low T4 like I showed in my last blood work. I realized that those stimulants, I watched a video with Dr. Elizabeth Bright talking to Rena the other day and I realized that when she said that stimulants can greatly enhance those thyroid problems, I thought, well, that, that is true for me in every case in my life where I have experienced the symptoms that I had recently, which was unexplained weight gain, fatigue, and depression. I've only had depression moments in my life, maybe four or five times that I can remember throughout the past, but they were all when I was using cannabis and probably nicotine in some cases, not always nicotine, but cannabis, and I think smoking cannabis has nicotine too. Uh, but then also coffee has been a part of my life all along. And I just realized that with my addictive nature, that I had to cut out all of it, including coffee. Now, I'm not trying to attack anybody's coffee. You guys drink your coffee if you want to. I know there's doctors that say it's healthy and things like that. But for me, it's kind of like a gateway that I was able to start with coffee this past year in 2023 because I was working a swing shift and I was trying to adjust my hours. And I got used to having coffee again. And then about four or five months into that, I was feeling like I was really under a lot of pressure at my work and I just got this new house built and I, you know, I wasn't expecting to be out of work again anyway. Uh, 2022, I was starting a new job that was supposed to be a potentially a career opportunity for me and things didn't work out in that area. And I made videos talking about what I was going through at that time. I didn't go into a lot of detail about that, but I can tell you that it was it was a lot of pressure on me as a man. And then I started working at UPS and that only lasted for the holiday season because after the holidays were over, they weren't giving me any hours. And then I had to find another position. And here I was an executive three years ago. And now I'm waiting tables at a restaurant and a hotel. And it was just, it was tough facing all that stuff. 
and uh, my wife vapes. So one day I was just like, Hey, let me hit that. Cause I used to vape all the time. I love nicotine. I always used to look at it the way Sherlock did in that TV series from the BBC. He's got like, it's a three patch problem. He's got three nicotine patches on because he needs to be able to focus. And I'm like, yeah, Hey, if it helps me focus, then I want some of that anyway. But I, I just, once you get that chemical in you, it just takes hold. And it's like, you got to keep giving it more and more. And if you don't, feed your body that it's such like this itching feeling that you've always got to be doing it. And I tried to break free from it, but it wasn't like the first time when I broke free from vaping, I was only vaping like 1.5 milligrams of nicotine in my, my liquid contents. And that was cutting it in half by mixing a zero Nick and a 1.5 Nick together to get it down to 0.75. And then eventually I went to zero so that I could taper off and get away from it. These new things they have for vape, you can't hardly do that anymore. I, I, I've been to tons of vape stores over the past few months whenever I would buy one or we would drive out of the out of the city. And I would realize nobody sells it like that anymore. Nobody offers you a zero nick option. Nobody offers where you can have a, a zero nick uh, flavor that you want and then get a small amount of nicotine mixed in. They all come in five milligrams, six milligrams, nine milligrams, 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams. I mean, I couldn't believe how high these were. I remember at one time, my height of using uh, vape nicotine was uh, 24 milligrams. And I remember thinking, man, this stuff burns my throat. And that was the only reason I cut back. I wanted all the nicotine I could get back then because I wasn't thinking like I do now. I wasn't thinking about health. I was just thinking how to cope how to cope with the problems I was facing, cope with the difficulties in my life. And I didn't realize that these stimulants were actually heightening my, my anxiety and my nervousness. And if a thyroid problem was going on at the same time, and I'm using all these stimulants, that would explain why I was having the depression and the fatigue and the weight gain. I mean, all of these things have been something that have come back just in 2023, just in smaller amounts. And I didn't really notice them. I thought, well, maybe it's because I'm eating a little bit of pork and bacon at work. Or maybe it's because they were spraying my my uh, the grill when I would order steaks at the restaurant I was working at. They would spray the grill with Vegeline and I didn't know that. They told me they weren't using any type of vegetable oils. So to find out later on that they were and that I've been having these troubles with keeping the weight off and not having the energy to exercise like I did before, I kind of blamed it on the fact that I got hurt while I was working at UPS. And I, you know, there was just so many things that I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. So to find out that it's thyroid and that it probably has been all my life because my doctor says there is no way that my diet did this to me. But what is very likely is that it's genetic. And when I look back on my life and I see all those moments in my life where these things were a problem, I don't doubt it. I certainly don't doubt it. Well, I wanted to take a look at this video uh, on Nutrition with Judy where she's talking to Dr. Elizabeth Bright. And the video title is called Thyroid Health and, Thri- Th- Thyroid Health and Thriving on a Carnivore Diet. I will put a link to the video in the description as well so you can watch the whole thing because this is an hour and five minutes long and I don't plan to record all of it or to present all of it here. Uh, I am just looking for information that might be helpful to my situation. Having been a carnivore for three years, finally realizing that I have a thyroid issue, finding out that TSH can be low one day and high the next. So when you get checked, a lot of times it can be a very difficult thing to follow, but I've had now two times in a row where my TSH was elevated and the first time it was just high normal. This time it was actually on the high side above normal. And that's the first time I've ever seen that. So I never really had that on my radar at all. Last year when I got my TSH number back and it was still in the normal range, but it was on the high side, I didn't really worry about it. But quite a few commenters said, that's a little high. You need to keep an eye on that. And that was one of the reasons why I had started using iodine because thyroid had been on my radar. A pharmacy friend of mine had pointed out that I I showed some signs of thyroid issues and I had talked about having itchy skin and cold feeling in my extremities, just, you know, difficult dealing with cold. Now I can deal with cold a good bit better than I used to, but I still don't like it. I'm a Florida boy. I love being in the heat. So all that being said, I'm on a mission to understand what's going on. And Dr. Bright seems to really know what she's talking about here. 
My doctor says that my diet certainly didn't cause any of this. So we're going to dig in. Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I am a nutritional therapy practitioner. I work with clients to get to root cause healing and oftentimes that is a meat-based diet to work on gut healing. So I had the pleasure of sitting down again with Dr. Elizabeth Bright. For those of you that don't know her, she is a naturopath and an osteopath and she focuses on the body's natural ability to heal. Dr. Bright is from the States but now lives in Italy and she has a practice there and works with patients to get to root cause healing by supporting the thyroid and hormones with a meat-based or carnivore diet. Let's get right into the conversation. Hi, Dr. Bright. I'm so excited to have you on again. Um, it's always a pleasure chatting with you, and I'm so excited to dive into hormones and thyroid information. Um, so if you can introduce yourself to the people listening and watching and just share how you use a high-fat uh, meat-based approach um, in your practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I actually, I'm a naturopath and osteopath, and I have a practice in southern Italy, but I do practice a lot online now. Um, I recently had to close, you know, I had to cl close my studio through the two lockdowns we had in Italy. And yes, I, was? I was actually recommending a ketogenic diet previously. I actually, I'm a naturopath and osteopath, and I have a practice. In Natri naturopath? I'm a naturopath and osteopath, and I have naturopath and osteopath let me check that out real quick naturopathy aims to educate the person to look after their own health and the health of their family minimizing symptoms of any illness supporting the body's capacity to heal and balancing the body so that illness is less likely to occur in the future a range of therapies are used to support this person okay so that's naturopath and an osteopath Osteopaths have the title of doctor, however, are not medical doctors. Osteopaths are allowed to use the title of doctor as long as they ensure their qualification and expertise is displayed as being an osteopath. What is osteopathic medicine and how is it different? Osteopathic medicine is a whole person approach to medicine treating the entire person rather than just the symptoms with a focus of prevention on preventative health care. Doctors of osteopathic medicine which are DOs, my previous doctor was a DO, help, uh, one of my previous doctors was a DO, help patients develop attitudes and lifestyles that don't just fight illness, but also help prevent it too. So that sounds like good medicine to me. I mean, osteopathy and naturopathy, I know they get thrown in with the pseudoscience stuff, but that's what Wikipedia says. Wikipedia is so full of lies, I never use it for a source of reference. And as a matter of fact, I find it to be the disinformation system that's available for us these days. So let's see what she has to say about this. Nevertheless, she's not a medical doctor, but she's doing something similar to what I'm doing. And what I'm doing has changed my life for the best. So I'm going to pursue on. Practice in Southern Italy, but I do practice a lot online now. Um, I recently had to close, you know, I had to cl close my studio through the two lockdowns we had in Italy. And yes, I, I was actually recommending a ketogenic diet previously. And then I went into menopause and I saw so many benefits from, and I went carnivore and I saw so many benefits for myself. And so that um, inspired me to do a lot of research. And then I wrote my book, Good Fat is Good for Women in Menopause. And it just became an integral part of my, um, of my protocol, the carnivore diet. Okay. And the high fat approach primarily sure. because Women who come to me have been avoiding fat for decades. They have been dieting for decades since they were adolescents. And for a period of time, a high fat approach definitely reduces inflammation for them and gives them back the fat in order to make those steroid hormones. Let's just um, take it back a little bit and just talk about the basics of thyroid, thyroid hormones. You know, I know 
that the hypothalamus um, produces TRH, which is a hormone that then signals the pituitary to then, and then the pituitary basically produces TSH to release to the thyroid that then produces T4 and then down the path to T3. But if you can just talk about the different, I guess, thyroid hormones and maybe even some of the antibodies, just some basics so we can understand and have the lay of the land so that we can then start talking about thyroid hormone. Yeah. So the thyroid actually makes several hormones. It makes T4, about 80% T4, 16% T3, uh, 4% T2 and T1. And T2 is becoming very interesting because it's very much involved in metabolism um, and really part of the functioning heart, you know? So it, it stimulates the, the heart muscle. Okay. And and then the thyroid also makes calcitonin, which regulates calcium in our body. So it's very, there's, it's not just the one hormone that it makes. And I believe that that T3 that the thyroid makes is very important also for the downstream conversion. Um, so then there, there's the thyroglobulin, which is made in the follicular cells of the thyroid. And that is part of the T4 to T3 synthesis. And then thyroid peroxidase is what uh, traps the iodine is an, it's an enzyme. The thyroglobin is a, is a protein and thyroid peroxidase is an enzyme. And that's involved. That's so first is thyroglobulin, then it moves to thyroid peroxidase, the enzyme. And that the finished product is after it works with the iodine is the thyroid hormone. So the problem with the antibodies is those two antibodies, antithyroglobulin and antithyroid peroxidase attack because they always attack protein derived products and they denature those uh, those substances. So if I were to go to my doctor, obviously the kind of conventional care, they only really measure TSH, but if I were to just get a basic panel, what markers would you say are a must um, to get? Well, I would definitely say, so the TSH is really important. That's the problem today is the TSH. And I will talk about that in a minute because the TSH, a lot of um, receptors are not, a lot of uh, the body is not receptive to the TSH. So there may be a need, so it doesn't tell, TSH doesn't respond when there's not enough hormone, for instance, but definitely TSH, free T3, free T4, because um, that's the function. The two antibodies, unfortunately, they usually often only ask for anti-TGO. Uh, in Europe now, all the labs say, studies show you should also ask for anti-TBO, and they usually do in Europe now. Uh, the other thing that I would look for I can't the function for some reason my I'm getting double hearing in my thing here. Let me see if I can restart this. All right, there we go. Let me make sure it's recording the audio. And it's not. Jeez. Oh, All right, I'll have to pause for a second and I'll be right back. All right, let's try again, see if I'm getting audio. TSH, free T3, free T4. Uh, I'm getting audio, but it's not letting me hear clearly. It keeps giving me static, and it's driving me nuts. I don't know what to do about it. I'm just going to try to see if I can't hear what she's saying. We put on closed captioning. Uh, the body is not receptive to the TSH, so there may be a need, so it doesn't tell. TSH doesn't respond when there's not enough hormone, for instance. But definitely TSH, free T3, free T4, because um, that's the function. The two antibodies, unfortunately, they usually often only ask for anti-TGO. Uh, in Europe now, all the labs say, studies show you should also ask for anti-TBO, and they usually do in Europe now. Uh, the other thing that I would look for, though, is not only those, because you can actually have a hypofunctioning thyroid and your blood numbers are okay. So that's why what we were talking about before, symptoms are so important. Um, there's so oh. many nutrients that are not absorbed, as you very well know. Just what she said right there blows me away. Because in 2020, I had that blood work done back in the, in the fall, and I was already having a lot of those symptoms of unexplained weight gain, fatigue, and depression, severe depression, all the way up through when I began lion diet. So that confirms exactly what my medical doctor said, that the TSH numbers don't give you enough information 
it's the symptoms and the, the, all of the other factors together and getting the T3 and the T4 being so important too. Now, my recent doctor, I asked him for do, to do T3 and T4, but he only sent in the order for TSH and T4. I was glad he at least did that because my previous doctors wouldn't do even that. They would only do the TSH and they wouldn't do T4. They wouldn't do T3. So the fact that he at least did the T4 and it showed that it was low is the first time that I've gotten real indication that I'm actually able to see that something is going on with my thyroid. And the symptoms that I've been experiencing, I have experienced multiple times in my life and never been able to get an explanation. I've been asked, I've been asked if I want to start doing an antidepressant for it, and I refuse to take those things because they made me feel worse than I did when I actually felt depressed. I felt like a zombie. So I said, no, I don't want any of that stuff. If that's your solution, you can take your solution and stick it somewhere. But I'm finally on to the root of what I think has been my problem most of my life. And I'm getting confirmation from both a medical doctor and now a osteopath, a naturopath, and we'll see where we go from here. While you're experiencing gut function, I look at vitamin D, what? I look at B12, Let I look me back at iron. For a second. The other thing that I would look for though is not only those because you can actually have a hypofunctioning thyroid and your blood numbers are okay. So that's why what we were talking about before, symptoms are so important. Um, there's so many nutrients that are not absorbed as you very well know with all your experience in gut function. I look at vitamin D, I look at B12, I look at iron. So you can kind of see if the thyroid's not working, there are these other things that won't work either. So my vitamin that D is low. something that I would investigate. For my vitamin D has been low, even though I've been walking in Florida and doing things where I'm out in the sun and getting full body exposure. I've even tanned naked all last year and didn't seem to do anything that I know of. I haven't had my D3 checked since then but I still take a, a D3 supplement. I'm taking, a, I was taking a drops supplement for a while and now I'm taking a, a capsule supplement, 50,000 IUs with a little bit of uh, something else in it that's supposed to help D3 work. I can't remember the name of it right now, but I brought that to my doctor and he was like, wow, I was surprised you could buy that over the counter because normally that's a prescription strength, but that's perfect. Take that once a week. He also, by the way, said to keep taking the iodine. There's nothing wrong with that, but this is a new one for me. So we're going to keep digging in, but just hearing her say that again, that you could have perfectly fine blood work numbers and still have hypothyroid because the symptoms I have are finally matching up with the blood work. And that was when I finally got my revelation. Yeah. And um, I know that a lot of the T4 is converted in the liver. And then there are some um, T3 in the peripheral t tissue. And then some of the, I guess, the conjugated versions of T4 um, in the gut then get converted to T3. So there's areas that we don't necessarily measure in the blood for T3. But I know that there are some people, including myself, that a low carb diet all of a sudden lowers the T3. Um, can you talk a little bit about if you see that as a normal state for a carno carnivore ketogenic diet, the TSH is normal, T4 no is normal, all the other markers that we mentioned are relatively normal, but the T3 is now below the normal range. Okay, well, first, we're not really sure that how much is converted in in the liver and the kidneys. Okay. So the diagnase is D1, D2, D3. D1 is in the liver and the kidneys, and they go from 81%, as high as 81% or as low as 15% as converted. So they don't really know. But these, you know, this is also new. They're still looking at these conversion pathways. Um, and the other thing is that, well, a re recent review said that they don't think that um, the primary conversion of T4 to T3 is necessarily D1 activated. So that's the idonase, that's the selenocysteine um, enzyme that's in those primarily in the liver and the kidneys gotcha. that's doing that, that conversion. A lot of conversion is done by D2, mm -hmm. which is in skeletal muscle, in the heart, and in the brain. So it, the interesting thing that the, th the conversion is done by adrenergic stimulation. So when there's stress 
or when you, you know, there's your sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, D2 will convert a bunch of T4 into T3 because you need to respond to that stimulus. The heart does. And then again, like I mentioned, T2, that's where the T2, the T3 to T2 is converted by the D2 because the heart rhythm is regulated by D2. So there's still a lot we don't know as far as that is. So peripheral tissue may be more important in converting than we actually know. It also is surprising to hear that there is so little known about how this all works. I think that it's one of those things where I figured people already know about this because sometimes they remove people's thyroid and some people have to take Synthroid or whatever the other medicines are that are available. I think there's some natural options that are available and they have to take that so that their body can produce the hormone that they need. I don't know how all that works, but it's one of those areas, just like many other areas of medicine where I thought they knew what they were talking about. Just like with my gallbladder when they took it out and they didn't know why I had gallstones. I know now that it's because I wasn't, I wasn't eating any fat and all that gall was just sitting in my gallbladder congealing and turning into stones and that I had been convinced that a low fat diet was the way to go. So it's frustrating. It's frustrating to find out that they, they claim to know so much and that they want so much control over our lives because of what they know about health and how to keep us healthy. And they keep feeding us garbage and giving us lies about all this medicine. It's frustrating. It's absolutely frustrating, but it's still comforting for me to finally know what might have been my problem all the way back to childhood, all the way back to when my mother and father put me on Ritalin because I was so depressed when I was younger and I would have such a hard time and I would get angry and frenetic about the problems that were going on in my little five or six or seven or eight year old life all the way up through teenage years, although I, did, I was off Ritalin after the age of, I think, 11, something like that. But it wasn't long later that I was on other stimulants, and it was something that Dr. Bright said that made me really think about the stimulant situation because she talked about how those stimulants can really push the hypothyroidism into high gear. And boy, I have, I have, in my lifetime, I have been a stimulant junkie. And I have, because of carnivore, been able to cut those stimulants out of my life. They've come back. I've cut them back out. They've come back. I've cut them back out. But now I'm back to zero again. But this time I have new knowledge. Before, I only knew that symptoms would come if I was doing cannabis especially and mixing that with a lot of stress. Uh, times in my life when I've been in positions of power or authority where I was getting more than I was used to as far as that. I was excelling in something that I was doing, but it was putting a lot of burden on me. It was like, okay, now I got to carry, I got to carry the mantle for this position that I'm in and that I'm using a lot of this stuff to relax at the end of the day. And ultimately it was causing chaos for my thyroid. Now that I know that, now that I know that the thyroid is the issue, it, I feel like I'm finally on track to getting some answers because meanwhile, I can take some thyroid hormone to help me overcome this. I'm only on day two of that, but I'm hoping to see some changes real soon because I'm going to tell you it's like I'm not me when those problems come. And that's one of the reasons I haven't been doing a lot of producing over the past couple of weeks because for the first time in three years, I have felt like I wasn't me. And it had a lot to do with having the coffee led me up to the nicotine. And then the nicotine became a regular thing again all the way up through December where I was still vaping. And I was trying to quit, trying to quit, trying to quit, trying to quit. And I just couldn't do it because it, I wasn't able to taper off. And I didn't want to go cold turkey because that's, that's rough. I mean, it's like you're fighting constantly. And uh, I finally did that. But it wasn't until after somebody gave me a Delta 8 pin for Christmas and I thought, well, you know, it's not a real thing. Maybe I can relax and enjoy this. And I did for a day. And then the next day I wanted some more. And the next day I wanted some more. And then I wound up getting another pin a few days later. And then I wound up having it again and again and again. And for like two solid weeks until I felt like I was losing my mind. And I, I, I had the, the depression. I had the fatigue. 
I, I had already had the weight gain all throughout 2023 that I could not explain. And then when I called my doctor about why my TSH was showing high and my T4 was low, he said, I wouldn't worry about it unless you have any of those symptoms that I just mentioned. And then it was like, there it is. It's thyroid. It always has been thyroid. And I'm just now figuring it out. But I do know that I didn't do myself any favors getting back on stimulants because when I was off of all those stimulants, I was not having any of those problems. I mean, I've talked about it on my channel before. Anxiety and depression have been gone, gone. Except for late 2022, I got a little bit anxious because I was not in that position anymore where I thought it was going to be a career. And I just, I prayed my way through it and did the best I could. Things got better. I actually quit smoking cannabis at the end of 2022 before I started working at UPS. And that was a big boon for me. I had quit vaping earlier that year. I had been off of coffee for a long time, but I was still using cannabis and that made it hard, I think, for me to get through that moment. But that was when I quit again. And then I let it creep back in this past Christmas and it's like it hit me like a train wreck. So I know now that that is the trigger for whatever is going on for me with as far as my thyroid goes. But I'm just learning. I'm just learning all this now. I'm trying to figure it out and I'm trying to piece it together because I want to be able to share it with you because if you're having symptoms like this and maybe you're still vaping, maybe you're still drinking coffee, maybe you're still smoking marijuana because I know a lot of people see it as totally innocuous and it's an excellent way to relax themselves and to deal with PTSD and a number of things. And I'm not here to say that none of that is true. I am just here to say that if you've got a thyroid problem, those stimulants can be a big issue from what I've been able to tell so far. Even though my T3 was technically low compared to the standard conventional markers, I mean, I feel fine. And not everyone feels fine with like a 1.7, 1.8 marker. But do you, would you consider that if we just look at symptoms, then maybe I'm okay? Definitely. So, so I, I mean, I got to tell you, in, in, in a lot of cases, I won't even look at the bloods because the symptoms are predominant. Okay. And that's how they did it before we had, we can't only look at numbers. The T, okay. the TSH um, is produced several times during the day. Um, you'll convert, as we said before, convert hormone as needed. If you didn't have symptoms, right. that's hugely important. The thing though, is that symptoms vacillate. So not in your case, but you can have low, you can go from low to hyperfunctioning especially in Hashimoto's, right. that's right. what we see a lot. But the carbs, that whole thing, I mean, I did a post about that too. There's absolutely no truth to that. Um, there's not a single, I read all those studies, most of them produced in the 80s. There's a single one that shows on a glucose diet with rats, glucose diet only, rat chow, T3 went down. All the studies in humans show only if it's a hypocaloric diet. And there's even one that they did fat or carbs mm -hmm. and it didn't go down. They raised a little bit of carbs. It didn't improve until they raised the caloric count. So it had nothing to do with the carbs. It had nothing to do with the macronutrient. It had to do with, they were starving. So that goes to D3, uh, reverse T3. I didn't talk about in the markers, which you were mentioning before. Reverse T3 is backpedaling T3. So if your body doesn't have enough food, or there's a ton of inflammation, you are in a stress state, your body is not gonna make T3, you're not gonna convert T3 because T3 is a growth hormone, it's a regenerating hormone, it's an energy hormone, you can't metabolize energy if you don't have it. Then in terms of what you're just mentioning, it's really interesting because a lot of people in the standard American diet, the conventional diets, their T3 is actually higher because um, maybe there's more of a demand for it, but it's not getting absorbed. And so it, it's usually like excess T3 causes T3 resistance. And then maybe if we're just naturally needing less of it, we are just more T3 sensitive, or again, it's in the peripheral tissues or some, it's, some of it's in the gut. But I mean, we naturally, our bodies produce our T3, which from my understanding, it's to pick up any excess T3 that then you can remove out of your body. So it's just- yeah. It's, it does that. Um, I have to tell you though, all of my patients, most of my patients came to me before they were carnivore. They all had low T3. Okay. Um, 
So there is a case to be made for using less, the whole Finney argument, you know, you need less D3, so you're making less. Um, but there's still a lot of people who are, who have symptoms and who are hypothyroid and they feel better when you treat the hyperthyroidism. So that to me, if you, I mean, immediately a carnivore diet is the best thing because it gives you the nutrients the thyroid needs. You say, you know, like you say, tyrosine, my big thing is iodine, carnivore diet, you get the zinc, um, the proteins, the, the everything you need is in the meat more than it is in the vegetables and the fruit. So you have the raw materials. If you add the iodine, you have the raw materials. However, many people are taking beta blockers. Many people are taking benzodiazepines. Many people are taking all kinds of drugs and stimulants. Remember, stimulants will lower thyroid function because that adrenal stimulation is constantly ongoing. Thyroid hormone will be converting okay. constantly in response. Okay. Like you run out of adrenal you know, function, you're going to run out of thyroid function as well. Maybe it's years of accumulation of excess stimulation oh. and all these drugs put into it. A lot yeah. of patients who come to me are on medication. Those interfere with thyroid conversion, thyroid absor absorption. Yeah, I didn't realize that beta blockers block because thyroid I, I have block thyroid receptors. Oh, that's interesting. Cause I do have clients that are on beta blockers, but they also are hypothyroid. So that's very interesting. And beta that blocker brain thyroid function. <laughs> this, this is the key. If I don't use anything else from this video, this is what I need to be able to look at because this is what set off the alarm bells in my head when she was talking to Rena and she asked about stimulants and stimulants were, had crept, crept back into my life just recently. And I finally cut them back out because I got scared to death about it. I said, okay, I got to go cold turkey. It's been a rough two weeks. I'm going to tell you it has been a rough two weeks since then. It's been a rough two weeks since then. And I am still getting over it. But wow. Wow. This is, throughout my life, stimulants have been a part of things. Ever, if you start all the way back with being on Ritalin when I was a kid, to smoking at a very early age, to drinking at a very early age, to later in my 20s starting marijuana, and also the stimulation that comes from sex and pornography and other things that were av available to me at the time, I was constantly seeking personal pleasure of some kind, it seems like, which, you know, the Bible tells us about how that's not what you're supposed to be seeking in this life, but of course... I was following my own path. I was going down the prodigal son path and thank God I woke up to it, but it's still one of those things that hangs around every once in a while. And because I've got people in my life that are still using those same stimulants and I'm not here to criticize them or put them down, but it makes it very easy for an addict to fall back into his addictions when he's around that kind of thing, just like with sugar. So, oh man, this really... I want you to listen to this part right here because this is what set off the alarm bells for me. Carnivore diet, you get the zinc, um, the proteins, the, the everything you need in the meat more than it is in the vegetables and the fruit. So you have the raw materials. If you add the iodine, you have the raw materials. However, many people are taking beta blockers. Many people are taking benzodiazepines. Many people are taking all kinds of drugs and stimulants, remember, stimulants will lower thyroid function because that adrenal stimulation is constantly ongoing. Thyroid hormone will be converting constantly in response. Okay. Like you run out of adrenal you know, function, you're going to run out of thyroid function as well. Maybe it's years of accumulation of excess stimulation and all these drugs put into it. A lot of the patients who come to me are on medication. Those interfere with thyroid conversion, thyroid absor absorption. Yeah, I didn't realize that beta blockers block because I, I have they block thyroid receptors. Oh, that's interesting because I do have clients that are on beta blockers, but they also are hypothyroid. So that's very interesting. Beta and that blocker brain thyroid function. <laughs> okay, good to know. As we're talking about some of the T4 gets converted to T3 in the liver. Maybe it's that we're inundating our liver with too much nutrition, right? So if you're eating a lot of liver, um, beef liver or chicken liver in a day, that the, it causes the liver to store a lot more of the nutrition. Maybe it's the, and then couple that with maybe higher fat. Well, that also affects 
the production of bile if your liver is not functioning as well. And then if you're taking medication, that's another tax on the liver. Um, oh, yeah. Medications, definitely. Yeah, and yeah. And yeah, all the stuff, you know, supplements too. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So fair you enough. Stuff it doesn't tax the liver. <laughs> I, I do think that hypernutrition from um, liver can uh, tax from the liver. Yeah, liver eating liver. Definitely. Yeah. Y- yes. Definitely. Yes. Because I know it's different than the taxation of medicine and supplements and anything else you do. And so that is true. But since the liver's role is to store some of the B12, and maybe it's not a ton of that because it is a water soluble, but B6 is a little bit stored as well. But really, like all the fat soluble vitamins are stored in the liver. And so it's just an added load to the liver. I guess that's the better way to say it. But Yes. And then I'll couple that with drinking alcohol and, you know, whatever else you do that then taxes the liver. Some of the the metabolism is managed by the liver and so on. And so that could be one reason why maybe someone becomes more hypothyroid on a carnivorous diet. It could be that, like you were saying, it's in the tissues or it's in our gut. But it's just funny that the answer is carbs. And so I don't know if is it the excuse that people wanted to eat carbs I don't know, like, what do you see in your practice? And- yeah, I kind of think so. I would certainly think so, because I'm going to tell you, I don't need many excuses to eat carbs. If I have an excuse, I'm very likely to take it. You know, people talk about how strong-willed I am on this. It's only because I've been scared to death that I stay away from them now completely. Even the experiments that I've done with them have proven to me that i got to stay away from them. I have no excuses to eat carbs. What I did make excuses for was for having the stimulants, coffee, which bridged into nicotine, which bridged into uh, Delta-8, which is a legal version of THC available in vape form and other forms that I thought was going to help me relax in the middle of extremely stressful circumstances in my life. Stressful for me. I mean, it wasn't like I was on the bomb squad or something, but it's a lot of pressure. What I'm dealing with right now with going from being in an executive position to being a waiter again. And not that there's anything wrong with being a waiter. Don't think I'm downgrading that. But you, you, you get those ideas in your head, especially as a man. Oh, executive level, waiter, not the same thing. And here I am 51 years old and I'm dealing with that. And I let those stimulants come in and my thyroid responded the way that it normally does, apparently, when I have that combination of stress and stimulants coming in. So I've cut the stress, I've cut the stimulants out. I'm hoping I'll be able to cut the stress out. This job still hasn't really started yet. I've only started doing like an hourly wage type of thing where we're helping prepare the restaurant to open. Hopefully it's going to open in the next couple of weeks and then I can start making enough money to keep paying my bills and stop using up my savings account to, to keep us afloat. And I know a lot of you people watching this are probably thinking, what, you got a YouTube channel with 50,000 subscribers. Aren't you already making tons of money from that? I make a little bit of money from that, but it isn't enough to pay all the bills for my family. Is it, it isn't enough to replace a one-person income for a four-person family living on, in a house in Florida. So, I mean, all I want to make, I am not trying to get rich doing this. That's why I don't go around trying to find new ways to present everything like it's all perfect. I want to just tell you guys the truth on what I'm facing. And if I don't tell you about this, there may be people out there who are experiencing exactly what I'm experiencing. Because I know a lot of people from my generation who got hooked on cigarettes and got hooked on drinking and got hooked on marijuana very early. And we found it to be a a release and a way to get out of our life for a little bit and to relax. But ultimately, especially if you have any natural thyroid issues, which my doctor seems to think could be the problem, then you might be exacerbating the problem that you think you're healing or you think you're easing by using those stimulants because it stimulates the thyroid. It stimulates the adrenals to constantly produce uh, so much that your thyroid's not producing as much, even though your body is saying, hey, thyroid, we need some thyroid hormone but it's not doing it because the adrenal situation is where it is. And you might be pushing your adrenals to their max too. I wouldn't doubt it. When I was into stimulants, whatever the stimulant was, whether it was coffee, nicotine, or or THC, I always did a lot of it. 
Whatever it was, I did a lot of it. I drank a lot of coffee. I vaped a lot. They used to call me the Hoover when I used to smoke weed because I would just finish off a whole bowl out of a bong back in the day. I'm glad I'm not there anymore. I don't want to be back there. I don't want that. And I've, I learned, and this is one of the reasons why I made that video about managing stress the other day. The important thing is to properly manage your stress, whether it's through meditation and prayer or exercise or whatever it might be. And sometimes the exercise can actually push your adrenals further so that you're exacerbating the problem if you're doing them together. And since I've been doing exercise at the same time as doing the stimulants, I think I just created a perfect storm for myself. But it, it was so necessary for me to go through this so that I could look back on my life and understand why at those points I was having this problem. And my doctor right now is hoping that once I get over this phase, I'll be able to stop taking the thyroid hormone because I'm not taking the stimulants anymore and I'll get back to the normal setting that I was at before. When, that What carnivore had already done for me, it had taken away all of the things that I started feeling about three weeks ago that just took me over. I mean, I had been feeling the pressure for several months, but it didn't become depression until right after Christmas, and then it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I, I, I don't want that ever again. And now that I know that I brought it on myself, I feel stupid. I don't know what else to say to you guys except that I always promise to tell you the truth, and anything that I'm going through while I'm doing this carnivore way of eating, I'm going to share with you. Um, I mean, I, um, the carbs are not, the, the thyroid does not need carbs. Um, carbs give you fast energy. And as you said, a lot of women are under eating right. and, or maybe, you know, men too are under eating. People are under eating and they go to bed and they're, they can't sleep because they, their brain doesn't have energy for them to sleep basically. So, it's not the carbs that make them sleep better. It's the fact that they're eating something that- 100%, I've talked about this many times on my channel. Back before I started eating this way, I could not get to sleep at night. Now, I would sit and look at the ceiling or the back of my eyelids for hours at a time, and I couldn't get to sleep. It's been thyroid related all along, and carnivore is what put me on the right path. them more of an immediate quick energy i always call it ether you know the, the fat and the protein are the base and the carb is a little bit of treble on top and you hear that you get rid of that right away but that's not that's not the, the lack of that is not what's causing the problem it's really the lack of nutrition it's the malnourishment from what i've seen in my practice um, that's why i make and i don't think that the liver i don't think that fat is a problem for the liver. We have gallbladders for that reason. I mean, that's why we have gallbladders. People who didn't eat a lot of fat, dieted all the time, probably have a hypotonic gallbladder, but it's there in order to just shoot out bile right. when right. fat hits the system. And I don't recommend people eating 400 grams of fat. I recommend small amounts throughout the day. It's a healing protocol. It's medicine. I always say fat is medicine in the beginning. Um, so fat with the meals, but also snacks throughout the day. So they're kind of grazing on fat. So they maintain that energy level in order to, for them to make this transition. If they're transitioning from a low calorie diet or a carb diet to carnivore diet, you can't make energy out of protein. So where's the energy coming from? All of a sudden the glucose is gone. You're going to have to give some fat in order to maintain that energy so you don't go haywire until you're adapted to it, until you're able to grab it as a resource. Otherwise, your body's looking for glucose, where to go, it doesn't recognize the fat. It doesn't know how it really want to use the protein unless you're starving. So that's why I recommend the high fat. If, if carbs are not necessary for thyroid health, why, why mm -hmm. do people believe that it's carbs that will provide thyroid health? because they're everywhere, because I, I live in Italy. Can you imagine? I mean, there's pasta, fruit, it's, it's, it's constant everywhere. And they think that I'm crazy because I'm Anglo. They think I can. I think it goes back to the same argument they were mentioning before is that people want to make excuses to eat carbohydrates. 
I've talked to people about doing a carnivore way of eating, and then I've even heard most recently the excuse was, well, my husband won't do that. He's Greek. He needs to have all of his fancy foods. I'm Italian. What do you think? We're known for eating all kinds of foods. I mean, Belfar Niente, do nothing beautifully. All we want to do is eat and relax in Italy. I mean, that was the notion that I got when I was there is just eat, drink, and be merry. But that's not that's not the lifestyle that's going to make my body healthy and happy. I know that now. And it's just, it's it's such a, it's like a punch in the face. It's a punch in the face to know that I could be so on track with all of this all this time and then to make the mistake with those stimulants to cause this problem for myself and to to let that stress and those stimulants come together when I've seen it over and over in my life, when those moments come together, those moments collide, it's a train wreck. It's just, it upsets me that I let that happen. Well, you live on me in fat because it's not my heritage, but it's actually is. I was raised on biscuits and pies and all that kind of stuff. So I just, again, I think it's quick energy. The whole world is going out for coffee, pastries, and cigarettes at 11 o'clock. And then they go out again, the whole world, three o'clock in the afternoon, they're all crashing. So it's a stimulant they're looking for. Sugar is a stimulant. To me, sugar is a stimulant. It gives you that quick drug type energy. That's why you reach for candy if you're crashing. You're not going to reach for bacon. We do now, but if you have the candy and you're crashing and the bacon's there, your brain will remember Oh, candy used to make me feel bam right away. Good. You're going to eat the candy. A lot of my clients don't get that afternoon dip. And if they do, a lot of them, if you really look at their diet closely, so they're almost all carnivore, but then they're eating those like drips of whether it's fruit, but lately I feel like it's the honey trend, but they're having drips (laughs) of honey. And I'm like, it's, that's the reason, right? It's your body's not fully using the fat. It's whenever you give that, like that dose of fructose or glucose, it's tapping into that. And then you have that dip in energy, but some people say they perform better um, at the gym with the honey or they sleep better. And so they leave in some, and so it becomes difficult to just have them really fully transition because there's other advocates that are fans of um, adding some of that. Yeah. I'd like to address that though, as an athlete Um, performance has to be, you have to think about what you're looking for in performance. I mean, if I, former running kung fu i'm sure if i ate some honey before doing a kung fu form i would probably would have popped it out a little bit better but what was it taking away from me i killed my adrenals doing kung fu now i'm doing stand-up paddle boarding it's a lot completely different form of energy it's more like running but slower and i think that we they're looking it's a stimulant i don't i'm sorry if if you want honey and you're going to work out, you're looking for your body to be able to perform how many reps, how much weight. If that's what it takes, it may be too much for your body to be doing what you're trying to do. Mm. And I'm just playing devil's advocate, but then why is it that, you know, there's that whole group of repeaters essentially, right? Let's just call them out. But why, why do they say like in all their studies, and maybe it's the rat studies you had just mentioned, but they say that um, our a low carb diet or a ketogenic carnivore diet gets our insulin too low. And then it basically affects any thyroid production and our, um, our metabolism just tanks. And so as women, we need even a little bit. I don't know. I'm sorry. I have looked there. There's no, I don't find those studies. Okay. I mean, from all the years I've been studying thyroid function, that's just not the case. You know, um, I just have to catch you know, show me the, to me because I don't find it all the research I've done and I've looked for it because of this. Um, and then the um, other question when you're talking about fat with digestion, so the thyroid is absolutely has something to do with metabolism. And so from my understanding, when you're a hypothyroid, your metabolism, metabolism is a little slower. And so therefore it may be hard to digest fat. And so that's my struggle. So there are some of my clients that are hypothyroid and they're like, okay, I'm eating your 75% fat or 80% fat in t- terms of total calories. And then Um, now my digest, like I feel so bloated and I feel unwell and I see that hypothyroid has a slow metabolism. So maybe I don't need as much fat. What are your thoughts with that? Well, the thyroid, um, metabolizes everything, the glucose, 
protein and fat, you're not going to digest anything if you're hypothyroid. So that's the problem. They're not, if, if they're hypothyroid, they can't make energy. So their energy that they eat without enough adequate T3 is not going to, I mean, the food that they eat is not going to turn into energy. So I really think that. It- I think that explains to me why I've, I have felt a lot more fatigued and I haven't wanted to do my exercise that I've been trying to push back into. I've been trying to force myself to, but it's like she said, if I can't make the energy to do it, that's where the problem has been. And that has only come in times where I have brought those stimulants back in to try to push through, pushing through, pushing through. Man. I for the for, since I found out about this, I had a hard time accepting. I gotta check the water softener. Okay, I'll try to remember. I've been trying to tell myself it can't just be the vaping and the nicotine. I mean, the, it can't just be the caffeine and the nicotine and the THC. Maybe it's just the THC. That's kind of what I was thinking. And maybe it was because it was Delta 8. But it, when I go back in my history, it's always been THC. And vaping has been a part of it, or smoking has been a part of it, and coffee has been a part of it, and alcohol has been a part of it. It's all played a role. And none of them have been good for me. And the more I stay away from them, the better off I'm going to be. Especially now that I know that I've had this issue possibly with thyroid all my life. Possibly because of the the way that I've starved my body of the nutrients that it needs following the low-fat protocols and trying to eat, excuse me, trying to eat some healthy version of the standard American diet following whatever nutrition advice I was given from these idiots over the years who would tell us to cut out the fat and to, to eat plenty of the grains and eat the whole grains and eat the cereals and drink the milk and all the things that got me into this boat. But it wasn't just the food. It was also the other things I was doing. So again, I'm not here to attack anyone's beloved coffee, but I think that we have made it into something that it's not and it's not necessarily what we need but especially if you're somebody like me who can easily step up from one to the next where you you're smoking a lot or you're vaping a lot or you're drinking a lot or you're even doing using uh marijuana whether it's legal or illegal You're setting yourself up for a position of failure. You're setting yourself up for that depression. And you convince yourself that you need more of whatever it was that got you there to help you feel better. Stimulant aspect of the carbs that people are looking for. Um, In the long run, if you're climbing the mountains, some matcha or yerba mate, whatever these stimulants are, you're going to need them to get to the top. But if you're not trained or you have to do it all the time, but these are not feats, physical feats that we're supposed to do. It's too stressful for us. So if you want to do that to your body, absolutely, you're going to need a stimulant. But if you want to be healthy without having a lot of inflammation and have a good amount of exercise that you enjoy, that makes you feel good, then fat and protein are adequate. That's, that's really the thing that maybe people are trying to do something that isn't good for them unless they're stimulant. As far as digesting fat, um, I just haven't had a lot of issues with I make because again, I break it into small amounts throughout the day and they are able to digest the fat. When, when someone is hypothyroid, how do you know that it's the thyroid versus the hypothalamus versus any of the other organs that we mentioned, um, or the pituitary, like, how do you know where the kind of defect is? That's, that's really hard. I see. Um, I see, I have maybe seen one person who had a conversion issue, like high T4, low T3, hardly ever see that. Um, you know, when you think about pituitary hypothalamus, you, there are medicines always looking for tumors, right? So if you think about what the pituitary is doing, it's really busy. If you're worried about the pancreas being busy, think about the, the pituitary, all the, it's a huge orchestra of hormones, you know, going out and coming in. And I think anytime you overstimulate production in any part of the body, you're going to get some 
sure. problems. Okay. Um, there are pathway issues. There are receptor issues. There, so there are just like in iodine, we say fluoride, the halides attached to iodine receptors. There are things that attach to thyroid receptors, and the thi thyroid hormone won't attach. So there's all kinds of things that could go, you know, go wrong. Uh, flavonoids, coffee, tea, those things interfere. Aspirin interferes. Again, I mentioned beta block. Calcium is really important for thyroid function. So beta blockers are blocking calcium. Benzodiazepines. There are plenty of things. If you if a person has gone through their lives taking these substances, perhaps that has downregulated function in a pathway. I don't know that you can pin with the kind of tests we have available to us. Again, I'm going to say I go back to symptoms mm -hmm. and clean up the diet, make sure they have iodine. And you may need, and obviously nutritional absorption is, gut function is really important. So I don't think we can know where it is all the time or where the whole, where the problem is, but we can just make them feel better. Right. And it doesn't really matter, right? As long as you pull the levers of the matter. diet. Yeah, the diet. Small thyroid. They have several patients with tiny thyroids. You can't see the thyroid. They just like they can't see. If you have Alzheimer's, they can't see your brain until you're dead. You can't see the thyroid until they're dead. The, the, an ultrasound is not really going to tell you much. It just gives you a very vague idea. They can catch, you know, look at the, a few nodules. They send a sound, a ping, to see if it's how the tissue, if it's vascular enough, so that if it's ecogenic, right? If it's hard, and if if the ping comes back that means it's not vascular right. and it has there's issues but smaller thyroids will produce fewer hormones what do you think then is the reason why thyroid imbalances are becoming more and more prevalent diet uh, all these medications that i just said and all of my most of my patients come to me on medication all i have two daughters all their friends are on antidepressants <clears throat> that's why i always recommend that's why my kids are carnivore now so there's so many things, iodine, iodine. I think that there's a lot more pollution interfering with iodine absorption. I think that there's overstimulation, um, light, phones. Again, the stimulation will over, possibly more thyroid is being made and just wasted. Just you're running through it. You're just like we said for the pancreas, for the insulin. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's kind of like how if you produce too much insulin over time, you become insulin resistant. And then maybe all these factors that initially get your thyroid to work a lot, and then eventually it becomes resistant. It makes sense. I mean, yeah, if you're constantly, constantly pushing yourself, I mean, I did that myself, I'm going to be 59. And I did that to myself with sports. If you're constantly doing and there's so many people who are doing that, I did that to my adrenals, you're there's something's going to have to give. So I think thyroid function will definitely be affected by that. One of the things you're bringing up is that we pull on our bodies to produce more thyroid. So um, I hear from you, it's um, exercise for sure. And then maybe some of the medication supplements. Um, what other things can be overusing the thyroid? And maybe it's everything, but I just want to. Everything. If, it's, if, if thyroid hormone conversion is done in all central nervous system tissue, just think of that happening all the time. Okay. You know, constantly. So, so I think light, I think sleep. This gives me hope that it's not permanent. I mean, I've been thinking up until I sat and watched this video that, I mean, cause the doctor said it may be genetic, but it's not from what you're eating because it's not from, it's not from eating a carnivore way of eating basically is what he was saying. And I wanted to believe that, but I want to understand why. I want to understand the details. And this, this is giving me everything that I needed to know because of my search for stimulants and stimulation in general, my habit of doing that, my addiction to those stimulants is what sparked this. Whew. Wow. I had no idea watching this video was going to be so eye-opening for situations that I've dealt with throughout my life, not understanding why I had all these reactions to things. Mm. Um, not sleeping lowers function. 
I mean, it's, I mean, I hate, I don't think you should be a Luddite and go and go in a cave and, and not do anything. But I just think if we care, compare our lifestyle to 50 years ago, um, I think there's a lot less sensory stimulation. Yeah. Sense. Oh. There's a lot of perfumes. Now there's these antiseptics everywhere. These, there's all these things are central nervous system stimulants. I know. That's why I was never really a big fan of, like those tea tree oils, the lavender scents, you know, um, a lot of people use those. And I think there's been a recent study that came out that it's over stimulating the endocrine system. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just, and then it's these essential oils. Like some people are okay with putting it just topically on your skin and not ingesting it. And then some people are recommending ingesting people it everywhere. They're in the air everywhere. Yeah. So um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and I've never just been a fan and it makes a lot of sense, especially if we become stimulated by regular sense. Well, these very concentrated ones, what does that mean for us? And, you know, I'm sure there's some benefits, but maybe a benefit can quickly become a toxin. Right. So I, I think that we are, I mean, our sense of, of scent of smell is incredibly important to alert us to danger. So it would be beneficial if it were medicinal in the sense that it would be possibly overriding something else, like if you're injured or something. But if you think about all the things, all the, we use things that have benefits for rats, you know, we see on paper that they have benefits, but if you're constantly subjecting your body to these, it's again, it's hyperstimulation. Medicine suppresses function. We want to improve function. So, you know, even if there are medicinal benefits, they may not be something that you need while you're, you know, hanging around your house in the, you know, in the morning. Yeah. I mean, they have diffusers that just are on all the time. Right. So yeah, I, I'm on this. Yeah, I've never liked it. Um, let's talk about either. iodine. So everyone is scared of iodine. <laughs> I mean, I, I've done multiple interviews and, and I've interviewed with Hakala labs and, you know, I've even had some feedback. Well, well, they, they make one of the tablets. And so therefore, obviously, they're going to show that everyone is deficient because they it's, so it's like a conflict of interest. Yeah. So therefore, they're not accurate, right? And there are so many studies that show um, the iodine deficiency and how our armies used to use it and just a bunch of things. But why, why is conventional medicine so scared of iodine? And there's this fear in the space that says, if you take too much iodine, you could wreck your thyroid. Well, I think that's primarily because of the wolf Chaikov effect. So right. up until 1948, every single thyroid doctor was prescribed, was giving Lugol's iodine to their patients for hyper and hypothyroidism. The, um, the thyroid needs 12 milligrams. The breasts need five milligrams. I mean, I, mucus is incredibly, iodine is really important for all the mucus producing tissues. So sinuses, vaginal, intestinal, but the wolf check off, the, they, they basically used radioactive iodine on those mice and, um, and radioactive iodine is the medical form of iodine, right? With all the medications are laced, the, the, uh, the antithyroid medications are laced with radioactive iodine, right? Natural iodine is not toxic. Radioactive iodine is toxic. So they used radioactive iodine. They used tons of it. And what it did was temporarily the thyroid was saturated with iodine. So it didn't need to take it up anymore temporarily for like two days, right? So they said that was hyperthyroidism. But they never tested those rats' thyroid levels. So oh, we don't know if their thyroid, if their T3 was and T4 were overproduced, right? They never um, did this in humans. It, it's so it didn't even show that those rats became hyperthyroid, right? So as even Wolf Chaikov said in, in 1969 that it was a transitory effect and that was not even basically the, the study didn't work, right? It wasn't true. The, but medicine grabbed it, never has never given up on that. And because I've heard this a lot from commenters saying that taking the uh, iodine could cause the TSH levels to rise or to cause some kind of thyroid problem. But I think all of this is speculation from exactly what she is talking about, because it doesn't make any sense if you're if you're 
T3 and T4 needs iodine to be able to convert properly down to T2 and T1 and the other things that your body needs and your body needs iodine in different parts of your body. It doesn't make any sense that taking natural iodine would cause any issues. It's the radioactive iodine. And that was always in the back of my head, but I didn't know why until she said that. And I remember I'd heard about that too. And I'm thinking, well, it's not radioactive iodine, so what am I worried about? You know, it just comes down to the fact that there's nothing wrong with taking some natural iodine or eating foods that are high in iodine because those should be good for your thyroid. It's keeping those doggone stimulants out of your life that's going to make such a big difference because that is exactly every point in my life when stimulants have been there a lot in my life. Stress at certain points in my life is where it pushes it over the edge and I get those feelings of depression and I get those those symptoms of unexplained weight gain and extreme fatigue that I didn't have before I started a carnivore way of eating and that I stopped drinking coffee very, very early. I didn't stop vaping right away, but I was vaping a very low nicotine and I had... I didn't stop smoking marijuana right away either, but I was trying to keep it to a minimum, you know, but I wasn't having a whole lot of stress. When I first started this way of eating, I had just sold some property that netted me a good bit of income, and then I had a lot of money in the bank, and since then, all that money has kind of disappeared. Then my job changed, and the income hasn't been there. The savings is still dwindling down. That stress building, along with that hyperstimulation going on, is what put my thyroid in a bad way. Even though I was taking the iodine, it had nothing to do with anything other than stress and overstimulation. Whew. What a revelation this is for me. I don't know if this is big of a revelation for you, but it is a big revelation for me. Iodine is natural, of course. So they recommend with the medicines, radioactive iodine, something normal and cheap like Lugol's, which gives your thyroid the potassium iodide and your breasts, uterus, and then the men, prostate, the iodine, elemental iodine. That's bad for you, yeah. That's what they want you to believe, right? Yeah, and it's interesting because everybody I've interviewed, like Lynn Farrow, Dr. Brownstein, they are big advocates for iodine, and it's just, there's so much pushback. In well, you we know. No, I was just going to ask you, do you, do you think you can overdo iodine? And I'm so in the Hakala labs, the founder, he said that they did studies with one gram of iodine and they have not shown um, any overdoing iodine. And we are recommending maybe like 12 and a half, even up to 50 milligrams, which is compared to a thousand milligrams. So have you seen anybody in your practice like no. overdo iodine? Okay. No, I have not. No, I have not. It just, it's eliminated via the urine. Okay. That's encouraging to me to hear her say, but it's also encouraging that my own family care doctor, the one that I chose specifically because he was outspoken against things that we now know are lies involved in the pandemic. He was outspoken about a lot of other things that are going on, especially in women's health, which uh, if you haven't heard of Dr. John Littell, I certainly uh, encourage you to look up his website, johnlittell.com. And he was 100% behind me taking iodine. I told him I'm taking three of these a day, even though it only says to take one. And I think it's, uh, let me grab the bottle. All right, this is extremely tiny print. I know my vision is a lot better since I started doing carnivore, but occasionally I have to use readers because this is ridiculously tiny white letters on black background. Potassium iodide, 12.7 milligrams. Molecular iodine, 3 milligrams. So I'm getting 9 milligrams of molecular iodine and 36, 37, 38, 38.1 of potassium iodide, 38 point, if, if, if your body treats them similarly, 38.1 plus nine, that's 47.1 milligrams of basically iodine that I am now taking every day. <clears throat> Over the past year or so, I've only taken two of these. So it's about a th two thirds of what I just said is what I've been getting. And it has selenium, it has some other things in it. It has uh, 50 micrograms of selenium, 25 micrograms of chromium as chromium picolinate and 20 milligrams of L-theanine, 
I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. And then it also has 1.3 milligrams of riboflavin, which is uh, vitamin B2. So you can take all the iodine you want for thyroid health, but if you're not managing your stress properly, and if you're overstimulating yourself, either with stimulants or stimulating sources, whether it's video games, sex, movies, there's sugar, there's so many things that we turn to for stimulation. And those stimulants can cause our thyroid to be not functioning like it should, so that we're hypothyroid. And the symptoms are the things that so many people complain about. Fatigue, weight gain, depression. I had all three when I started, and I had all three when I was continuing to do stimulants like I shouldn't. And I'm just here to tell you guys, I have bent on coffee. Even in the beginning of this discussion, I was kind of trying to say, I'm not here to take away your precious coffee. But I'm telling you right now, if you're suffering with any of the symptoms that are of hypothyroidism, and even if your TSH looks okay, if your doctor's not checking these other markers, the T3 and the T4, to see if you're actually producing the, the thyroid hormone that your body needs, not just producing the hormone that tells your thyroid to produce that hormone, but also your actual hormone production of that, of uh, uh, your thyroid production of that hormone, then you're not getting the whole picture. And I believe that's been the case for me for a very long time because I've been highly overstimulated in my life, whether it was sugar, nicotine, all of those things. I mean, everything that you could get for stimulation, with the exception of the hardest drugs that everybody recognizes, I didn't touch those, but I thought, well, these are all safe and okay. So I was just ramping up on all of them. And again, as much as I hate that this has happened to me here just in the past few weeks, I'm glad it happened so that I can talk to you about something that I was not, not only not aware of, I had no idea that it had anything to do with the thyroid or how the thyroid affected you symptom-wise until now. I knew some of the small symptoms like the itchy skin or dry skin and, and cold feeling and uh, bags under the eyes, some of the things like that. I had no idea about the depression and the the unexpected weight gain and the fatigue. Actually, fatigue I knew was one of them. But fatigue seems to be a symptom of just about everything that you're not supposed to be doing. So if you can stay away from the things you're not supposed to be doing, it certainly helps. Carnivore way of eating made it easier for me to get off of a lot of these stimulants. But my addiction tried to bring me back. The stress plus my addiction tried to bring me back. I don't want you guys to fall into the same thing I just fell into. And I look forward to being able to progress and talk about this more. But I know I'm already going to get a lot of flack for this. I know I'm going to get a lot of comments from carnivore haters, from vegans who want to come and say that the carnivore diet caused this or something like that. I know better. And those of you who know and follow me know that I am not here to hide anything. I'm here to try to help you figure out how you can get healthy because I want us all to be happier and healthier. Let's finish this video up. I mean, that's in my experience and my experience, but I don't know. I wouldn't drink a gallon. <laughs> of course. Definitely not. You'd be sick to your stomach. Would it ruin your thyroid? No, I don't think so. I think you'd be so sick to your stomach, you'd vomit and... More people are doing the Hecala Lab iodine test and they're showing excess levels of fluoride and excess levels of bromide. And so whatever they're supplementing with iodine, it's not even getting really absorbed because it's helping to detox the other halides, as you yeah, mentioned. There's so much more of that. There's so much more. Again, that's kind of the things that what I mentioned before, the substances. We can't even see every year eat the, the you know, the organization that tells you which chemicals or in the sunscreen, and then they've changed the name. And there's always more chemicals in our water supply, in our air that we don't even know about. And I just think iodine is a, a safe, cheap way to detox and detox in the sense that sort of keep your mucus thriving uh, strong enough to keep stuff out of you. So yes, definitely, there's a lot more of receptor pollution. What are your thoughts about some of the companion supplements? So I know, I think with one of our clients, you recommend not to take the selenium. I'm just curious. Some people are saying to take the selenium with your meats. I know that there are some meats that have selenium. I found that it's 
a mixed bag based on the hair mineral test. Some people, even though they eat sufficient meat, maybe they're not absorbing the selenium. So I wanted to pick your brain about that. Do you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, selenium is funny, you know, it can become toxic. So it's kind of not like B12 or it's actually too much of it can, cannot be a good idea. And you also, you don't need a lot. Got you it. don't need a lot of selenium. And I have never had anybody who had a conversion issue. The selenium is important for converting. Got it. The T, that's the, the D1, D2, D3 are made out of selenium proteins. So you don't need a lot. I think that an eggs, a carnivore and eggs and, and meat can get an adequate amount. Usually we used to, as a naturopath, before I became carnivore, I used to recommend 200 micrograms. Now as a carnivore, I would max at 100 micrograms. If, you know, maybe on one of your tests, they come up really low, but I don't. Uh, yeah. I, I normally only recommend about, I think it's, is one, I forget how much, I think it's maybe 99 milligrams or maybe that's potassium, but all right, it's good to know that I'm not <clears throat> overdoing it based on her numbers because I'm getting 150 micrograms if I'm taking three of these a day. But I do eat a lot of meat, and I know it has selenium too. Since I'm eating a lot of meat, I could always look and see if I could find an iodine supplement that doesn't have selenium because I remember thinking I needed to have selenium for iodine to take effect properly. But if I'm already eating a lot of meat, I need to find out how much selenium is in. Let's see. Mostly I eat ribeyes. 23.68 micrograms of selenium in a ribeye steak. I eat roughly two ribeye steaks every day or a burger in a ribeye steak or some variety of other meats when I'm eating a whole cow, but I eat a lot of ribeyes. And if I'm getting 23.68 micrograms in your average ribeye steak, and I don't eat your average ribeye steak, so let's just say 25 micrograms per ribeye steak and I eat two, that's 50. And if I'm taking three of these, that's 150. I'm getting 200. I'm right at the amount she said might be, uh, she wouldn't go over. I think taking three of these now might be pushing it. I increased it to three when I saw my TSH was high because I had originally started doing three and then I scaled it back down because I was concerned about the selenium, but I didn't know what to be concerned about specifically. And now that I've got some numbers to use, I may just go back to taking two of these at a time and making sure that I am managing that stress and keeping those stimulants out. Usually yeah, it's a very it low dose. So I, yeah. I'm on the same page. And when I talked to Dr. Brownstein, he lives in Michigan. He said in his waters, I guess there's sufficient selenium. So he never recommends supplementing yeah. selenium. Yeah. I guess it's really bio-individual. And then the Coke factors, the other Coke factors. The I pretty much only drink water that I get from uh, the store, which is either Primo purified water or club soda. And I drink an awful lot of club soda and it doesn't have it's purified beforehand. But when you start messing with supplements, I'm, I'm really learning that you, you've got to be careful what's in those things. Because for the most part, I don't think supplements do much of anything. Like she said, if you take too much iodine, you're just going to wind up urinating it out. So I haven't worried about that. But the selenium gives me pause enough to go back to what I was taking, which is two pills of this, if I'm going to be eating two steaks a day. And I'm not drinking water that has selenium because I'm drinking purified water. Then I don't think I have anything to worry about on the selenium side as long as I'm not overdoing the supplementation that involves selenium. And I've had people ask me about this before, and I really just didn't know what to say. It's so revealing to have this information. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of us out there. I would never have watched this video had I not gotten this information that my TSH was high and my T4 was low and that I had been kind of monitoring my thyroid for a while now. My body has been so affected by bad diet for so long, cutting out things that were important for my body like fat and avoiding iodine and avoiding salt. All the things that I know now are actually healthy for my body. But for 48 years, I left those things on the wayside. And it has not done my body any good. It's definitely not, not done my thyroid any good. And then on top of that, all the stimulants that I've been seeking and searching for in my life and using and thinking it's okay. Everybody else does it. 
It's ubiquitous. Everybody, it's no big deal. Consuming sugar, all these things. Man. You guys are watching a eureka moment right here for me. Even though I've been on this way of eating for three years and it has changed so much, if it wasn't for what happened this past few months and these, really these past couple of weeks, I would not have been able to put all of this together like I have today. And I hope you appreciate this video because it's a lot longer than I would normally like to make. But I think it's very important. Basically, you know, it's the zinc, the go, it, it, it's, it's sort of in there. And that's why the carnivore diet is so great that you have all these, if you're eating a plant-based diet, yeah, you're going to probably need some cofactors with your iodine in order to absorb it and synthesize it. But on a carnivore diet, I think you need less. Does the iodine impact the thyroid supplementation, the levels? Yeah. yeah uh, okay. So the iodine just gives the raw material. I really also recommend iodine not just for the thyroid but for breast and ovaries oh, yeah, absolutely and, right. yeah so yes Honestly. you have to go in a carnivore you have to have good nutrients and iodine in order to make thyroid hormone it definitely helps people usually have a few days immediately they feel a little bit of energy that they didn't have before i see that all the time yeah i've had some I noticed people that when where I started they take it. a drop or two and and uh, the two percent and mm -hmm. then their body freaks out because maybe yeah, they just I have too. Okay. Yeah. Why, why is that? It's just, they're so deficient that their body's kind of. Yeah. Yes. Or they have to, or they have too many halides. So if they have a lot of fluoride or bromide, that tiny drop of iodine is just going to make the cup run over because the body thinks there's a ton of iodine when there's actually fluoride and bromide. So you have to do the, you know, Brownstein salt loading protocol and eliminate that. Usually I recommend two days off. I didn't have any of that because I haven't drank regular tap water in a long time. I've told the dentist for years not to give me fluoride. Uh, I don't eat bread, so I'm not getting any kind of bromides from anywhere. I didn't have any of that related issue there at all. In between of uh, the first two <clears throat> weeks of the iodine protocol to eliminate the lights. Or I have a client. She is, I think she's 16. And she was diagnosed as hypothyroid and she has been supplementing just a little bit of the iodine and it's been a life changer for her. So that, I'm sorry. Definitely. For adolescents, very important. Oh yeah. She, she feels night and day different. And it was sad because she felt depressed and, you know, anything that she'd eat would affect her and she'd feel bloat. And then she just, the biggest change for her, cause she's struggling with the diet a little bit, but the but she's incorporating more meats but she's just having a hard time removing some of the gluten and stuff but she's supplementing iodine and that change has been so significant on her and it just further you know after talking with you and all the other interviews i've done it's just i don't know why people are so scared of iodine when it could do wonders um for people it's, it's very sad it's a crime actually because i really you know the recent i mean there are so many fibrocystic breasts a lot of my patients have their cysts and then they don't have cysts anymore or they don't feel them anymore and then it's just too big but again it's natural so it's the same problem we have with we say all these good things the carnivore diet does who's going to make money off of that you know, know. a few ranchers and chicken <laughs> farmers I mean, so it's not Unfortunately, that is, you know, that has a lot to do with it. I know. I, and I agree. And it's unfortunate. And, and the more that we are getting censored and on a yeah. lot of these platforms is unfortunate. Yeah. Are there people that can just fully heal one day on a carnivore high fat diet? Uh, some, um, I think they'd have to be younger than me. That's for sure. Years and years of dieting, years and years of stressing your body will even if you have all the nutrients in place like i said before with the pathways maybe just we can't see exactly what isn't functioning properly and if you are having symptoms and you're not feeling well um i think of t4 as medication but i don't really think of natural desiccated thyroid as much as medication if you want to get off all medications and you're taking uh, somebody, you know, hypothetical person is taking beta blockers, antidepressants, all these things, and they have natural desiccated thyroid, I would call all those things medications. And I would think that getting off of all those things, they're getting off of medications. But if they still have symptoms, then I don't think it's a bad thing to it's it, I, your body needs it, we can't really, especially if you have symptoms.
Right. So you live in a no stress environment. Remember, the body needs more if you're stressed. Mm -hmm. So what we see as stress, 50 years ago, somebody would not have been able to handle. So if you can go to an island and you can fish or hunt and you don't have taxes or anything to worry about and you eat a great carnivore diet, probably. I'll tell you, I didn't eat, she mentioned taxes and I just thought about, I have got so much to do to get ready for tax season. And I can't even think of all the directions that I've got to go for this because running your own business like this, it is complicated to get it all together. And I don't do a lot of record keeping when I buy everything. I buy everything with a credit card so that I can go back and track it. But sometimes I can't look up the actual invoices or receipts. And I have a hard time keeping up with all the receipts. And that's the stress on me right now. And I know you guys have got all this same stress. I'm not trying to ask for pity or anything like that here. I'm just letting you know that I know what you're going through too because everybody has got to deal with all these stresses and things like that. And that stress is so big of a deal. And those stimulants that we use to deal with stress, it's a perfect storm, y'all. Maybe you could get off, not need any more thyroid support in that way. But I don't know who can do that. And it also depends how old you are. Okay. So basically if you've overstimulated your body, there might just be a point with your age that a diet can definitely lower the amounts, but maybe you oh, might yeah. still need some. And that makes sense. Yeah. Some people think carnivore is a magic pill, but it does a lot. But I think sometimes we still need some support. So, Absolutely. Yeah, I don't like yeah, pills though. I wouldn't want to think of a carnivore diet. It's great. I wouldn't want to think of it as a medicine. It's it's just new giving your body what it needs to heal itself. Why are you taking a pill? You're giving your body what it needs to heal itself. So if your body is in some way that we don't know a slightly damaged or handicapped, right. then I um, um I wanted to ask you about bioidentical hormones. So I have some clients um, recently, maybe in their forties, they started taking some of the like estrogen, progesterone. I'm not even sure which one, but they're more in their seventies and taking the same amount and then taking like every single sex hormone you could think of, including DHA and all of this. And I just started thinking, I don't know if that can be good for you. Right. So if you're taking the same hormone levels as someone that or or in your body, the total amount is the same as someone that's 40 when you're 70, is that good? I mean, can it possibly fast gear aging? Um, are you talking about 70 year old would be, would need fewer hormones? So if mm -hmm. the 70 year old is taking the same amount of like estrogen and progesterone that maybe a 40 right. year old would have, but they're right. taking it exogenously with maybe the bioidentical hormones. Oh, so the 70 year old is trying to raise their levels of up to a 40 year old person. Essentially. Yes. By taking hormones. Okay. Horm those, those hormones are definitely medicine. So that's something you definitely want to get off. Um, but your body, we always need estrogen. We always need progesterone. I mean, when I'm 70, I want to have the same energy and sex life. And I mean, I'm going to look different of course, but as when I was 40, so we always need those things. We don't need those things if we're not going to have babies. So we, I mean, sorry, we do need those things, but we don't need ovarian estrogen if we're not going to have babies. We don't need ovarian progesterone if we're not going to have babies. We need adrenal progesterone and adrenal estrogen. We need those. We needed those when we were pre-adolescent, you know, before we menstruated and we need them when we're no longer menstruating. We never stop needing them. So the 70 year old definitely needs estrogen and progesterone, but I would hope that they would get it from their fat. I would hope that they would eat a high fat diet or enough fat in order for them to be able to make their own progesterone and estrogen. Cause that's what our body is supposed to do after menopause with menopause. Right. My overarching question, I guess it needs to be very bio individual. So maybe there's no answer, but if she's taking the same amount and let's just assume she's taking the adrenal version of these um, hormones and not the ovary one, but if she's taking the same amount she was taking back then, can it accelerate the aging process? Is having too many of these bioidentical hormones, like what's the yeah, adverse yeah. effect of it, even if she's saying she feels great on them? And I don't know. Yeah, I um, I, I'm 
I'm terribly biased about this stuff. So you know that from reading my book. They're synthetic. Bioidentical hormones are synthetic. We don't make them. They're no less, they're no less synthetic than the Premarin, you know, conjugated from horse, you know, from the urine of horses. Right. So I don't, I don't see that it does it accelerate the aging process. Too much hormone of, of any kind definitely would definitely affect the liver, um, accelerate the aging process in the sense that too much estrogen lowers thyroid function. There's all kinds of stuff that the, that too much of something that we don't need is going to cause inflammation and possibly, I mean, if, if, if inflammation is aging or. Right. Okay. So. Yeah. And she's hypothyroid. So, I mean, who knows if some of those. There you go. You can't make estrogen and progesterone. If you're hypothyroid, you can't synthesize them. T3 synthesizes those hormones. So again, on an as need basis, the certain part of your body that needs progesterone and estrogen at that time, T3 will come along and say, okay, that part needs it. Okay. Make it boom the aromatase that'll be synthesized down the hormones cascade. So, but not if you're hypothyroid, you don't have enough T3. Right. But so you, go it makes sense to me to go higher up. Why take these synthetic hormones down here? The thyroid is the one that decides everything is the hormone of the body that decides everything. So the major orchestra conductor here, fix yeah. that. And she might just be in a vicious cycle, right? So because she's taking everything exogenously, maybe her yeah. body is just very confused or the conductor is very confused. And that makes a lot of sense. I just wanted to pick your brain about that. There's a relationship between sodium and blood pressure and the thyroid. Can you just talk about that pathway a little bit for people to understand? Yeah. So, so hypothyroidism causes hypertension. Um, the beat, it causes vascular resistance because the heart has to beat so much harder because everything is slowed down. So there's less volume for each heart. I did notice <clears throat> that when I went to my doctor and I didn't think about it until she just said that about it hypothyroid can cause hypertension. I've been having excellent blood pressure numbers. Every time I've gone to the doctor, I'm in the 120s and the 80s range. I mean, it's perfect as you could ask for. Until I went to the doctor to review this recent blood work and talk to him about the thyroid situation, and my blood pressure was 130, which is elevated for my uh, systolic, and then my diastolic was 90, which was I hadn't hit 90. I can't even remember when I was hitting high seventies, low eighties on a regular basis. So to know that the stress and the stimulants can push my thyroid in the direction they don't need to be in. I'm getting enough iodine. Got to watch the selenium intake. So I'm cutting back on that. A lot of people have commented about some of these things and I just didn't know what they were talking about. But it's so good to be able to dig into these things. And I hope you guys have spent the time to watch this with me. If you have had any situations where you've been dealing with some kind of depression or unexpa unexplained weight gain or fatigue or inflammation, maybe that you've been getting from over exercise or overstimulating yourself or you're still smoking or drinking or doing alcohol or any of that stuff. All of this is just it, it's like it connects all the dots that I had missing. I knew the carnivore diet had changed everything for the better, but I didn't understand what was happening in 2023. And now I'm finally putting some of the pieces together that the addictions in my life, the stresses in my life, how I'm managing those stresses have been exacerbating some of my problem. And even though I've been able to maintain great shape and great health, and I love that, I knew something was different and I knew something wasn't working right. And I didn't know it was something that I was doing so it has to be boom harder and that causes vascular Trust resistance about that there's a relationship between sodium and blood pressure and the thyroid can you just talk about that pathway a little bit for people to understand yeah so so hypothyroidism causes hypertension um the beat it causes vascular resistance because the heart has to beat so much harder because everything is slowed down so there's less volume for each heartbeat so it has to be boom harder and that causes vascular resistance therefore causing hypertension at the same time we're not even considering the adrenergic stimulation of the hypothyroid, which would also cause hypertension, sympathetic hypertension, which is most people who have hypertension have sympathetic hypertension, but then they go on beta blockers. But anyway, um, <laughs> you have sodium issues and hypothyroidism. Your body 
will the kidneys don't handle salt right anymore they don't handle any any electrolytes properly anymore so you will have a tissue accumulation of sodium because it's not being drained by the kidneys so the the uh, organs aren't getting sodium so they're not getting the really important sodium potassium pump activators for you know stimulation of function but you have all the sodium in the tissue so you're very sensitive to salt tiny bit of salt makes you feel terrible because your your body thinks it has all the salt in you but it's not getting to the heart and that causes a lot of problems so what do they do because i i do have clients like that right in their hair mineral tests they'll show that they need salt but when they yeah. feel, take salt they feel horrible and they are hypothyroid so what's the idea um I would also look at adrenal function because, you know, the adrenals are the ones that aldosterone via the kidney. I would also look at adrenal. But I feel like everyone is high stress. So at this point with my clients, I just think, okay, aldosterone, the adrenals, the endocrine systems already crashed. So let's focus on, you know, the thyroid and gut health and obviously lowering all the stress. But so what would you recommend to somebody like that though? So that they have hypothyroid and they're showing needs of salt, but when they take in salt, they feel, you know, the edema and other things, they just do not feel good. So. Yeah. Um, well, I'd have to see how they're treating their hypothyroidism. Okay. Fair enough. That would be one very important part. So T4, mm, a lot of issues with T4, uh, with levothyroxine, um, only medications because there's there's only t4 so we're we've been talking a long time about conversion there will be conversion issues if you can't convert the t4 into t3 t2 t1 okay so that'll definitely and then also i mean i have patients who are feeling terrible and after a week of a high fat carnivore diet and iodine they want to go run or they want to do something because they feel, and maybe they feel a tiny bit better or they just feel like they have to, they should. I always say exercise should be fun. And if you really have the energy to do it, do it, but don't push yourself. Otherwise you're only mm. going to worsen your thyroid function, your adrenal function. You definitely won't lose weight. So, so in general, what I'm hearing from you is uh, for women that have hormonal imbalances, thyroid imbalances, you would recommend? I would recommend definitely a carnivore diet. Like I said before, it gives you all the nutrients you need. And there's no baggage with the carnivore diet. If you have any absorption issues or digestive issues, I mean, you may have them initially until you transition, yeah. but you're not taking in all this crap that you don't. So she segued away, away from what I was just listening to and that, that, hit me also is the exercise side side of this is that I have been pushing myself to do more exercise than I would normally like to do, but it's because I feel like it's good for you. It's something that you should be doing. And recently I've cut back on the other exercises I was doing along with sprinting. Lately, I've just been doing sprinting the past week. And I find that that feels like enough. Because I feel really good, even in my upper body, I feel good after sprinting. And I don't feel like I need to do the weightlifting and things like I've been doing. And Dr. Romara talks about that too. And I'm looking forward to talking to him soon about that. Because we're going to be on a, a call together. We're going to be on a live stream together here on my channel at the beginning of February. So keep your eyes open for that too. And uh, we'll, we'll keep looking at all this. But... Well, this this video takes a load off my mind when you when you think you've got thyroid problems after three years of carnivore and you wonder what in the world happened. It's really just that I, I finally detected the cause of the mixing of stress and stimulants in my life and possibly the exercise, too, with my life and putting a lot of stress on my thyroid because of the things that I'm doing aside from my diet. Because my diet has fixed everything, except this came back, and it really came back, I think, when I started pushing myself too hard. We're gonna see. We're gonna see how it goes. I'm gonna stick with the sprinting. I'm gonna stick with the lower dose of iodine. I'm gonna go down to two tablets. I'm gonna drop the DHEA, and uh, not gonna be doing 
the hormones for thyroid, but for just a little while to help get over the, the hump, I guess, because that's what my doctor wanted me to do for three months. And I trust Dr. Littell. He's not like other doctors. He didn't want to prescribe this medicine. I basically begged for it because of the depression that I was feeling. That depression was crippling, crippling me in the morning, making it very hard to get up and do anything I needed to do. Wasn't it, Sam? And uh, that's, it's just refreshing to hear somebody who has experience and knowledge and worked with many people with these issues and that specifically deals with carnivore. <sighs> Eat, bang for your buck, you're getting all the nutrition that you need. And then iodine, absolutely. And I mean, the stress, boy, that's, you know, that sort of comes up a lot. And when we talk and when I talk sure with is. my patients, we're pushing ourselves a lot. And I think that we have to kind no of stress, look at yeah. if what we're doing is bringing, uh, bringing us joy, I guess that thing, right? There's this, uh, does it give you joy? If what you're doing is not making you happy, then we all have to work. That's enough That's stress. Right. We have, uh, we try to find something that makes us feel uh, validated in life. Right. And nutrition just does works wonders. And unfortunately, many adolescents are iodine deficient like you saw with your patient yeah the body's doing so much at that so much at that period in your life but women more because women have more iodine needing tissues right. so breasts and ovaries so do your daughters take iodine as well oh yeah i'm always shipping to glasgow to greece to shipping my son to shipping out iodine yeah, I'm, um, I, I've been giving my sons um, a little bit of iodine, but they hate the taste of the drops. And I feel that the drops are a little bit more effective than the the tablet version. So, Oh, I do too, because they're more absorption. Okay. I do too. Okay, um, I use gelatin that. caps. You can try gelatin caps. Just put a drop in a gelatin cap. Oh, I didn't even think about that. That's so smart. Okay. Yeah, that's the biggest um, struggle of my clients is I cannot drink that those yes. drops because yeah. it's Me disgusting. Either. So I'm like, yeah. with a little bit of salt water or, or like take like a shot and just add a little bit of water and then drink something else right after. But so then a lot of I mean, people opt for the tablets, but okay. I didn't even think about the gelatin. Yeah. Tablets. I've never, I've never recommended the tablets, but also, you know, when you're swallowing it, I, if you have an infection of some for and nasal and uh, respiratory issue, I would drink it because, you know, iodine is oh, vapor. Right. So you want to get it in, in the nose and the mucus. If you don't have any of that, just the gelatin cap is fine. That's so interesting. I never thought about doing that because I interviewed with a dentist, a carnivore dentist, and he recommended that some people swish with the probiotics in the mouth and then swallow it at night. But I never thought that, yeah, the iodine actually makes sense as well. Um, it's fascinating because there's so much more information um, coming out about dental health and how it affects our whole, because we are swallowing so much mucus every day. And if you have oral issues or nasal issues, it's going down into your gut and then it affects everything else. So it's just well, salt pipes. I recommend salt pipes. So what's that? Salt pipe. So you, um, you take a little <laughs> bottle, you add some salt, like a teaspoon, one drop of iodine and you inhale, you, you breathe it in and that can clear your nasal passages oh, and you so get, cause you need it in your respiratory system. You need it in lung tissue. Mucus is, our immune system is mucus. You need iodine. That's why there's so much iodine in our mucus because it's so important to our immune system. You know, a lot of mold lives in your nasal cavity. Yeah. And so a lot of people would have these drops of, I don't even know what they are. Um, but yeah, I guess iodine is an, an option. It's quite have. strong. It's quite <laughs> strong. So it starts you know, very slowly, but it definitely gets some iodine in your mucus because you know you're, you need iodine everywhere. So if it goes in your intestines with a gelatin cap or you're drinking it, if you're drinking it a tiny bit is vaporized and it'll go in your right. nasal passage, but it has a lot of work to do. So you could say that if definitely if you're congested or you have a cold, nobody I know who takes iodine has colds anymore, but if you happen to have a cold, you make a salt pipe and you, you know, one or two. That makes sense. Works. So where can people find you? Um, online, my website, elizbright.com. I'm putting up, I'm doing a series. I'm almost done with my thyroid series videos. I'm doing adrenal function next. I have kind of closed my physical studio since the last lockdown. So online is really where you're going to find me. So elizbright.com. And yes, I'm 
I have a small, I like to keep things small, but I don't do a lot on Instagram because I do want to kind of keep things a little small so I can handle it. Yeah, that's a way to manage stress. So I fully get it. <laughs> so I can be paddle boarding on the water as well. I love paddle boarding. I haven't been able to go as much because my sons didn't know how to swim. My oldest now does. So I'm waiting for the younger one to catch up and swim so that, I mean, there's so much paddle boarding in Austin. So I'm just waiting because I used to paddle board and kayak a lot. But with the kids, it's like, I think the mommy protective person in me was scared that they'd fall out of the water. And I, you know, so. Sure. Well, thank you so much for um, chatting with me. It's always a pleasure. And I, I love that. I wanted to go ahead and leave the part in there where she left her information, but I wanted to research this and I wanted to be able to share it with you guys. And this video is two years old. So I would encourage you to recommend this video, not the one that I'm making, but the one that Judy made for anybody who's having thyroid issues, especially if they're on a carnivore diet and they're wondering, hey, why is my TSH up high? What's going on with this? And they're also under a lot of stress, like almost all of us are. And they're maybe also using a lot of stimulants like almost all of us are. This could be a game changer for you. <clears throat> well, I hope you've enjoyed this amount of time we've spent together. I'm going to have a quick little message from one of my affiliates here at the end if you want to stick around and watch that. Uh, I only recommend products that I use myself. And it looks like I'm going to be using a few less products than I used to use, cutting out the DHEA. I may go back to a liquid form of iodine. One of the reasons I switched to this form of iodine was not because of the, the uh, easiness of taking it as opposed to the liquid, although I didn't like the liquid. It was more the, the quantity of iodine that I was getting in the tablet as opposed to the quantity I was getting in Lugol's and drops. This is like a lot more iodine than what's in the, I'd practically have to drink a whole bottle of Lugol's to do what a couple of these pills would do. And maybe I'm just peeing all that out though. So <sighs> I got some work to do. I got some work to do, but now I know what I need to keep out of my life. Stress, overstimulation, keep the good fats, keep the good meats, and you can minimize the uh, intake of supplements and things. It's very encouraging. I hope it was encouraging for you. It's definitely been encouraging for me. When I started out to record this, I really didn't know what to expect. But man, I feel like the Holy Spirit just led me into the right direction today. And I hope it's been beneficial for you because it's definitely been beneficial for me. Well, that being said, I'll see you guys next time. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat? One of the things I do to fight back against big food and big pharma is to recommend companies that make animal-based products that are good for our bodies and good for our skin. In this case, I'm talking about Vintage Tradition. Vintage Tradition tallow bombs are a go-to for me now, especially the unscented one. I like it because it doesn't have anything extra in it other than extra virgin olive oil and tallow rendered from suet. This is the interior fat, also called suet or kidney fat. For the tallow they use making the tallow bomb, highly saturated and therefore more therapeutic than any other. They don't use any trim fat or any other fats besides suet. So if you want some ancestrally appropriate skincare products that are going to help support the carnivore movement, head over to VintageTradition.com and use my discount code DANTE, D-A-N-T-E, to save 10% on your order. I promise you won't regret it. Their products are fantastic. I love them and I use them all the time.